We are face to face with a deliberate split, which gloats on its own discomfiture and grows more self-assured and triumphant the more its biological energy decreases. Nietzsche is referring to the split in consciousness between our unconscious, embodied, animalistic emotions and the conscious self-awareness of them. Conscious awareness of our animalistic instincts and emotions allows us to exert control over them, inhibiting them. The emergence of self-aware thinking and the awareness of oneself, the awareness of I, creates a split from our previously primitive unconscious animalistic lives where we just acted without thinking. Through self-awareness, we have the opportunity to inhibit these animalistic drives. This split may however be deadly, putting human beings on track to divorce themselves from the emotions and the instincts, creating epidemics of mental illnesses. Too much self-awareness and inhibition of the instincts leads to too much self-aware thinking and analysing, resulting in a separation between bodily drives and the ideation of the mind. This increase in conscious awareness and of I seems to have evolved largely through the increasing size of the frontal lobes, particularly as the frontal lobes have become more specialised away from direct union with motor areas and therefore motor action. In other words, the increasing separation between the frontal lobes and brain areas specialising in movement creates a split, choice to act or not. Essentially, conscious awareness allows us to inhibit our actions. Rather than monkey see, monkey do, it has become for modern man, monkey see, monkey think, monkey maybe do. The awareness of our animalistic and primordial impulses and emotions rewards humans with reduced impulsivity, abstract thinking and planning, but the cost may be fatal. Yark Panksepp the man who coined effective neuroscience noted the possible dangers of disconnection from our animalistic lives predicated on the older, more primordial and deeper layers of the brain, the newly evolved layers being particularly the cortex and the frontal lobes. The price of certain evolutionary adaptations may be mental aberrations in a certain percentage of the population. For instance, the emergence of self-centered types of thought where individuals persist in pursuing very limited and specialized lines of cognitive activity, should we call it academic autism, beneficial up to a point, might also cascade into the excesses of obsessive compulsive and full-blown autistic disorders. The former appear to arise from excessive frontal lobe activity, while the latter are characterized by a disconnection of lower processes, such as cerebellar and limbic emotional ones, from the higher ones. This self-awareness takes us out of our natural mindedness. We have the ability to get in the way of ourselves by the tricks of the analytical and rational self-aware mind. Consequently, we can increasingly abstract, thinking about who we are, how we should act, therefore impeding the natural form of acting in unison with our impulses and emotions. This is ultimately a double-edged sword, and we are stabbing ourselves deeper than ever by our awareness of deep primitive intuition and emotions. We destroy the instincts as opposed to integrating them. In doing so, we cut off our deeper instinctive nature. We become like fish outside of water, and the result is thinking that the overly conscious mind is the one that is in charge, not the deeper and foundational layers of instinct. As Jung wrote, It is very important to have a nice house with central heating and possibly also a car, but we all have an inner need to express the whole personality of man. For what could we do with a horse that is not a horse, or a tiger that tries to be a good tiger and eats apples? God made the horse and the tiger to be what they are, but to us it has become more important to be Mr. So-and-so than to fulfill the primitive task of being a human being. Similarly, perhaps this is the proper meaning of what Albert Camus meant by man is the only creature who refuses to be what he is. It is quite clear also 
that this type of overly self-aware consciousness is what Dostoevsky is getting at when he speaks from the tormented perspective of the guilt-ridden, overly self-aware underground man. I swear, gentlemen, that to be too conscious is an illness, a real thoroughgoing illness. For man's everyday needs, it would have been quite enough to have the ordinary human consciousness. I did not believe it was the same with other people, and all my life I hid this fact about myself as a secret. I was ashamed, even now perhaps I am ashamed. I got to the point of feeling a sort of secret, abnormal, despicable enjoyment in returning home to my corner on some disgusting Petersburg night, acutely conscious that that day I had committed a loathsome action again, that what was done could never be undone, and secretly, inwardly gnawing, gnawing at myself for it, tearing and consuming myself till at last the bitterness turned into a sort of shameful, accursed sweetness and at last into positive, real enjoyment. Yes, into enjoyment, into enjoyment. I insist upon that. I have spoken of this because I keep wanting to know for a fact whether other people feel such enjoyment. I will explain. The enjoyment was just from the too intense consciousness of one's own degradation. It was from feeling oneself that one had reached the last barrier, that it was horrible, but that it could not be otherwise, that there was no escape for you, that you could never become a different man, that even if time and faith were still left for you to change into something different, you would most likely not wish to change. Or if you did wish to, even then you would do nothing, because perhaps in reality there was nothing for you to change into. And the worst of it was, and the root of it all, that it was all in accord with the normal fundamental laws of over-acute consciousness and with the inertia that was the direct result of those laws, and that consequently one was not only unable to change, but could do absolutely nothing. This kind of self-centered consciousness is an overthinking that is characteristic of an overwhelming number of mental illnesses, including social anxiety disorders, autism, eating disorders, traumatic disorders, and schizophrenia. By no means is this overly analytical conscious thinking exclusive to mental illnesses, however. It is exponentiated by the fruit of modern and postmodern culture of which we are exposed and enforced by today. In fact, the evidence shows that schizophrenia, a disorder characterized by overthinking and divorce from emotions in real life, emerged largely with industrialization and is by far more common in Western culture, where it is mostly prevalent in cities. The most bureaucratic, ideological, postmodern, and industrialized of all places. In his seminal masterpiece, Madness and Modernism, Louis Sars notes how our current modern and postmodern cultural climate, with its disembodied abstract and overly analytical mindedness, is extremely similar to the schizophrenic view of the world and take on reality. As Sars wrote, As we approach modern times, we find more and more evidence of patients manifesting a symptomatic picture involving withdrawal, highly idiosyncratic and abstract patterns of thinking, and a preoccupation with hidden meanings. Certain theorists who see Western societies as having moved into a stage of postmodernity, emphasize a somewhat different set of developments, among them the waning of affect, the dissolution of the sense of separate selfhood, the loss of any sense of the real, and the saturation by images and simulcra detached from all grounding outside themselves. These, obviously, are more than a little reminiscent of certain schizoid and schizophrenic tendencies, and it is not difficult to imagine that such general cultural developments might also influence the modes of experience characteristic of such individuals. A nuanced video into how Western modernism and postmodernism zeitgeist are contributing to this explosion of mental illness is warranting of itself. As Nietzsche wrote, how knowledge will take its revenge on us, 
just as ignorance exacted its revenge during the Middle Ages. One of the most prominent philosophers in history, Alfred North Whitehead, is famous for saying, the purpose of thinking is to let our ideas die instead of us. He is right, except that our ideas can also kill us. Ideas can be overly abstracted, often unpragmatic from the real world. We can theorize about ideas and test them without vulnerably testing ourselves. As our consciousness has become biased to these abstract ideas and less towards embodied action and motor response in conjunction with thinking, the unity of body and mind, the ideas have become so tyrannical that we have increased the disconnection between our bodily unity with the emotions and biological drives. Secondly, not all ideas can be tested simply through the mind as they are mental affairs. Most of our ideas are too complex to test out simply through thinking alone. To really test ideas, especially the deepest and most fundamental ideas, we have to live them. They cannot be tested through thinking alone. However, Western civilization has emphasized nowadays that self-centered thoughts and abstract ideas are enough. We seem to have forgotten pragmatism, which is the closest thing to reality. Indeed, White had warned against this in 1938, claiming that mankind's degeneration will be through our excessive ability to think abstractly, divorced from the emotions and the pragmatism of the body. The higher animals are distinguished from mere life by their abstractions and by their use of them. Mankind is distinguished from animal life by its emphasis on abstractions. The degeneracy of mankind is distinguished from its uprise by the dominance of chill abstractions, divorced from aesthetic content. By aesthetic content, Whitehead means the natural sensory and emotional tendencies of man. Abstractions devoid of this lack any intuitive notion of bodily senses. They are abstractions of over-analyzing, theorizing and ideating to death. This is precisely the case, so much with the obsessive compulsive, the schizophrenic, the anorexic and the autistic, and is more broadly the modern and postmodern climate of the ironic, sarcastic, distanced observer reflecting on his own awareness, stuck in the chains of the solipsistic construction of himself and his world, displacing what is the now of experience, which is the fundamental, immediate relationship with reality as it is felt. A lack of feeling leads to the inability to properly understand the impact one's ideas have pragmatically. This can be seen among many of the prominent ideologies of the day, including communism, which is a mental affair when tried in reality, ends in a bureaucratic authoritarian nightmare. Similarly, postmodernist beliefs, such as meaning and morals being entirely relative, that we construct reality entirely based on our brain, or more particularly, what society teaches us, is merely a narcissistic and analytical trick of the solipsistic, overly abstracting conscious mind, devoid from the limitation of the emotions, body, space and time. This trick of our consciousness is what Jung is referring to when he says of modern mankind, our cerebral consciousness is like an actor who has forgotten that he is playing a role. Einstein feared the dangers of our analytical emphasis. The deeper and most meaningful truths of existence can't be grasped by logic and the general mechanical procedural view as advocated by mainstream science or captured by the categorical nets of language devoid of real life like in postmodernist philosophy and culture. Einstein did not think in language or in mechanical procedures but reached his truths by metaphor and intuition. As he sadly wrote, certainly we should take care not to make the intellect our god. It has, of course, powerful muscles, but no personality. It cannot lead, it can only serve, 
and it is not fastidious in its choices of a leader. It is blind to ends and values. So, it is no wonder that this fatal blindedness is handed on from old to young and today involves a whole generation. Additionally, Einstein favoured intuition. The superior implicit and emotional reasoning of the subconscious mind. The intuitive mind is a sacred gift, and the rational mind is a faithful servant. We have created a society that honours the servant and has forgotten the gift. The neurologist and philosopher Ian McGilchrist agrees. As he wrote in his seminal masterpiece, The Matter with Things, in conjunction with Nietzsche, Nietzsche bemoaned the state of normal human beings, those semi-animals unhinged from instinct and no longer able to count on the guidance of their unconscious drives, being forced instead to think, deduce, calculate, weigh, cause and effect, unhappy people reduced to their weakest, most fallible organ, their consciousness. Nietzsche is describing the loss of intuition, which is wholly, inadequately replaced. The schizophrenic is the apotheosis of this tendency in modern man. Nietzsche's prototype of theoretical man and his determination to destroy myth. Myth is otherwise known as the deep, embodied, imaginative understanding available and seen by the overly analytical reflexive mind as a lie. Some may be upset or in disagreement about Nietzsche being used here, as he has been hailed as a postmodernist by many prominent scholars. Unfortunately, mainly due to his view of the relativity of morality. Yet, as Sars points out, there is a certain irony in the fact that Nietzsche, a strong critic of all that would slash undermine vitality and passion, should have been appropriated by the postmodernist and post-structuralist movements. In the following passage from an interview, Derrida describes the quality of his own writing and that of more than a few postmodernists and post-structuralists as a meaning to say nothing, which is simultaneously insistent and elliptical, imprinting, as you saw, even its erasures, carrying off each concept into an interminable chain of differences, surrounding or confusing itself with so many precautions, references, notes, citations, collages, supplements. This persistent obsessing self-undermining but also self-admiring voice is hardly suggestive of the Dionysianism described in The Birth of Tragedy. Deconstructionism is, in fact, far more reminiscent of Socrates, Nietzsche's prototype of the theoretical man, that almost instinctive critic who hears only voices that seek to dissuade, who is bent on the extermination of myth and finds his highest satisfaction in the unveiling process itself, which proves to him his own power. And as McGilchrist wrote in his prior seminal work, The Master and His Emissary, referring to the excessive overthinking of being concerned with oneself, like the anorexic being concerned with her body image, or the autoerotic postmodernist stuck in the text, divorced from experience in real life, Hegel's prediction that reality would come to be experienced as a mere appearance due to the eye has been most fully realized. The awareness of ourself, the I, cuts one out of the flow of experience. This style of consciousness and thinking in excess, like in current times, creates a non-living world, a solipsistic world of language signs like Derrida's, a world we don't take part in, an earth we never implant our feet in, thus we cannot even abandon ourselves to the world anymore, having never entered into it. The evolution of our brains has provided us with a wonderful kind of rationality, not reason, but a sort of analytical and logical mind that does not also sufficiently incorporate the emotions and the instincts, which are absolutely necessary. Indeed, 
Studies show that self-consciousness impedes the ability to integrate the emotions and see the whole picture of a situation or matter, as opposed to unconscious and intuitive forms of evaluation. Thinking without properly incorporating feeling is simply cold mental affairs in which the impact on human beings is severe, a loss of empathy, identity and culture, reducing people to machines or equations of cost and benefit or tools to be manipulated, fruit from lacking regard in the impact of one's technological advancement or manipulation for profit or cultural shift which has no relationship with the millions of years of mankind's developed nervous system, emotions and life which all leads to a disarray of the senses or the obliteration of them. The result is a civilization characterized by a tomb in which a corpse lives where wasps have laid eggs only to hatch and grow into more destruction. The moralism of the Greek philosophers from Plato onward is the result of a pathological condition. Likewise, their admiration for dialectic, reason equals virtue equals happiness, simply means we have to imitate Socrates and produce a permanent daylight against the dark desires, the daylight of reason. We have to be cunning, sharp, clear at all costs. Every acquiescence to the instincts, to the unconscious, leads downward. The most glaring daylight, rationality at all costs. A life clear, cold, careful, aware, without instinct, in resistance to the instincts, was itself just a sickness, another sickness, and not at all a way back to virtue, to health, to happiness. We are now approaching a crucial moment in the history of mankind. Whether our souls become static and lifeless like machines and automatons, stuck in the text and in our silly ideologies, birthed by an overly analytical or self-aware civilization, at war with the unconscious and our emotions, or whether we choose to live reinstates what it means to be a human being. Man has come to regard all these beliefs as superstitions, and refuses to accept or to submit to anything which he does not rationally understand. The rationalist whose reason is not sufficient to teach him those limitations of the powers of conscious reason, and who despises all the institutions and customs which have not been consciously designed, would thus become the destroyer of the civilization built upon them. This may well prove a hurdle which man will repeatedly reach only to be thrown back into barbarism.